the court. So I think we're recording, buddy. Yes, sir. We surely are. All righty. Hey, hey, do you remember the poem? Man, uh, I was just thinking that too. I don't know if I do remember the poem. Right or left. Or right, right or, or left. Wrong. Right or wrong. Together our voices make a song. For in the end, we are friends. In your and opinion, I'll defend. That's right. That's right. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I had my days. It's like the depression in that uh, creative writing class. <laughs> We've all been there. I was in eighth grade once too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the last grade that I passed. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was eighth. Yeah, I, I went, I got through 12, but 13 was just too damn hard. I got, <laughs> I got distracted by all the ashtrays. Yeah, no, yeah, the, the doobie ashtrays. <laughs> no, it's like, because uh, we, we joke, it's like, uh, you know, you go to, I went to Germanic Community College, you know, for a semester. And it was like, uh, you know, it's just high school with an ashtray. That was the joke, you know. It's, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right? I could see that. I'll pretend like I know for the sake of the story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess. I guess that's what college is like. I've been on a community college campus once. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, I tell you, the math was just awful. I couldn't, I couldn't handle the math, and so I dropped out. Ended yeah. up going in the Navy. Was it like statistics or something? It it was like uh, like calculus and shit. It was like yeah. It's like an, I, I still didn't. Uh, Still didn't see the point of algebra yet, you know. And to be honest, the out of the algebra I learned, you know, the only time I ever really really used algebra was because I played role playing games. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> because you know sometimes you have to do mathematical equations to figure something out, and so forth. And the for these role playing games, and uh, but that's the only time, you know. If I didn't, if if I if you don't play role playing games, you probably never need algebra. <laughs> I I was good at algebra in school and then but but I was such a fuck off kid and such a troublemaker that my teachers when they asked me to like they, they would ask me to show my work and yeah I, I kind of couldn't like I, I just did fucking long form algebra up here yeah and uh because I couldn't show my work they thought I was cheating cheating yeah yeah, and that kind of discouraged me from from learning algebra more. It wasn't until I started getting more into writing comedy and being creative that I wanted to relearn algebra because there's something about joke writing that's algebraic. You know, there's a lot of times that you have X and Y and you're trying to solve for Z and find that missing link sure. of the joke. Yeah, it's, it's a formula, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get, I, and I didn't want to start studying geometry until I became aware of the concept of sacred geometry and like all the spiritual shit that goes with that. But if I, I wish that I knew about that stuff when I was in school, because maybe I would have been more interested and applied myself a little more. Well, it's certainly something they need to uh, uh, bring up. I think, I think it would have been cool. And like, uh, like my geometry class, if they talked about platonic solids, you know, because platonic solids and the guy, you know, my algebra teacher could have brought in a, uh, 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 D20, a 12 sided dice. And it's like, because <laughs> all these platonic <laughs> solids, you know, it, it's equal, equal surface area distributed ar around the entire geometric shape. And that's right. how, that's how dice are made. And so uh -huh. I think that that's kind of cool. It's like, you can have all sorts of different types of polygons, but <clears throat> the platonic solids are pretty amazing because of their mathematical symmetry and so forth. It's, it's really uh -huh. interesting. And I think that that's how they could turn people onto it. It's like, you know, practical application of math instead of just coming in there and you're like three X equals, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, if you can show exactly. Cause I, I know I was an example of this, but a lot of kids growing up and going to school were like, why do I need to know this? Why do I need to learn this and shit like that? And some teachers would try to teach you, but none of the reasons were ever that valid yeah but you should know so that if you're a fucking professional baseball player you can figure out your batting average like what <laughs> absolutely well that i mean also i mean that's also brings geometry back into it you know 
because geometry is used a lot in physics and physics is baseball. Baseball is a lot yeah. of physics. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you can learn like how, like how to hold the bat to get a better, you know, leverage or get a better, you know, uh, or how to do, uh, make your swing better. You know, you can use geometry right. for that. The yeah. same as billiards and pool. Absolutely. That's, that's very geometrical. I mean, but even simple stuff like being a house painter, you need to know math so you can figure out the area space of, of the house and the room so you know how much paint to buy. How much paint, exactly. You don't want to buy too much. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to buy too much. Yeah, exactly. Especially these days. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or shit, uh, you know, to, to work in construction. Yeah. A lot, a lot of that's math and, and geometry and yeah. Uh, fractions. <laughs> fractions. Yes, fractions. Yeah, you'd be surprised how few people know how to read a tape measure. Absolutely. It's kind of astonishing. Yeah, I mean, I was I was lucky because like, at you know, after, after I dropped out of college, I uh, worked at hanging sheetrock for a while. And that put a lot of, uh, you know, uh, that kind of work, that kind of trade work is just so undervalued in our, our society today. Uh -huh. And I think it was it was such a wonderful learning experience for me because it put it into uh, practice uh, all the like math that I learned, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. but also like uh, instilled a work ethic in me, yep. you know, and uh, <clears throat> and plus the feeling of accomplishment, turning a, a house that's just a framed house into more of a home. You know, you got a sense of accomplishment, like uh, any room you're in inside of a house, you know, you, there's probably drywall on the walls. And yeah. be before that's there, it's just wood, you know, wood two by fours. Oh, it's just a frame. Exactly. So in some small way, I made a house more into a home and that felt that gave me a feeling of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And now, even though you haven't practiced those, those tools or those skills in a while, I should say, still, if a time came that you needed to, you know, build something or be a part of a building project, say if the fucking fall of society came, we need to build shelter. Yeah. Those things will come back to you. You know what I mean? It's still buried in the back of your brain somewhere. And uh, most of what we learn is like riding a bike, you know? Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, actually, wow, this is like 15, 20 years ago, we had a dog and um, he tore up the uh, drywall, scratch it uh, near, near the door, tore up the drywall near the door. And we had to have a guy come in and like, just, you know, cut a little piece of sheetrock and put it up there, you know, take the old one off and stuff like that. And now I could do that if I needed to. I could do the taping and the, you know, everything, the sanding, everything too. You know, so, I mean, it, those are good skills. Those are good skills. But Same. hey, man, it's been a while since we've done the Scott versus Scott thing. And it's like, you've, uh, you've, you've had a move. We had, to, we had to go to switch to a Zoom meeting because we can't physically be in the same room anymore, which bums me out. Yeah, it does so. But thank God for technology because we can still talk so forth. <laughs> Yeah, it's cool. It's kind of surreal, man. It's, it's, this has been a big adjustment getting, because uh, for those of you who don't know, I moved to Austin, Texas. I left Virginia on July 19th. I got here on the 24th. And it's been a huge adjustment, Scott, um, especially trying to get used to not being able to see my friends as often as I previously was, you know? Sure, sure. You're a real social animal. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I've fucking, you know, I'll be 30 in November. I've lived my whole life in Fredericksburg, you know, with the exception of like six months. Yeah. And those are two different three month spans. So the longest I've ever lived away from Fredericksburg <laughs> is three months. Right wow. now, I'm, right now I'm at like eight weeks here. So wow. we're going to get past that three months. Well, you know, it's like, like my dad always told me, got to go out on the limb because that's where the fruit is. You know. you know, I've been thinking about something that you were talking to me about before I left. You were talking about a biblical figure and how he didn't leave until he was like 80 or something like that. He never. Uh, yeah, Moses, I think. And um, and how it's good to to get out of that comfort zone and go to a new place and fucking learn. Even if you're 80, you know, because uh, 80 is going to come whether you leave or not. You know? yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. When my dad yeah. went to get his yeah. master's, he's like, well, you know. Uh, my dad went to get his master's and he was like, well, you know, I don't know. I'm going to be like 60 years old and have a master's degree. And it's like, well, you're going to be 60 years old no matter what. So are you going to be 60 with or without a master's degree? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then the thing about that, you know, I remember days that I used to like miss work, right? By, by 11 a.m. 
I was like, man, I wish I went to work today. And that's what's going to happen if you deny the chance to get that degree when you're 60 that by the time you hit 62 and you're just sitting on the couch watching fucking mash you're gonna be like damn i wish i got that degree <laughs> but hawkeye sure is dropping some knowledge man i miss that show it's a good show it was i've never seen the movie I've never seen the movie uh yeah i didn't see the movie i heard it was uh far more serious than the show yeah, yeah. uh because that, that show has cool. a lot of serious points, you know, you know what course. I mean? But uh, the theme song to MASH is a song called Suicide is Painless, which is a kind of a beautiful song, you know. And uh, 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 that's a pretty heavy theme, especially for TV in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Uh -huh. you know? And uh, additionally, they had Klinger in there. Klinger was the transvestite, the guy who dressed up in women's clothing and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, dude, wow, how far ahead of their time. Well, I mean, I don't think I mean, it's necessarily ahead of their time. I mean, because uh, I think there's been men who dress up like women for that's all throughout true. human history. I mean, originally when they started doing like Shakespearean plays and stuff, women weren't actress. They, they, yep. they were involved and men would dress as women and play those roles. Correct. And um, uh, uh, in Islamic cultures, uh, men will dress in the burqas and stuff like that to escape detection. You know, that's why they're big on that. It's like because they can they can hide among the females you know um you ever seen a movie called the life of brian monty python movie of course uh there's a scene the stoning where the guy's sitting there he's being stoned for blasphemy because said the this that bit of halibut was fit enough for jehovah uh -huh. hilarious scene and then all of a sudden they start throwing stones at him and then they're like are there any women in the crowd and they're all, all the people who are doing the stone and stoning are women when in beards and stuff like that pretending to be men so they can be involved in the stoning and so I mean, it's not exactly a new concept, you know, be, being a transvestite. The new concept well, is these people thinking that they you, that Klinger is actually a female. And it's like, no, no. Right. Look at that. Look at the that. Whole, yeah. <laughs> the whole thing of Klinger's story and reason for doing it is because he's trying to get considered insane. Exactly. So he can get out. Discharge. Yeah, exactly. And now, I mean, it's like if, if MASH is going, taking place today, it's like there's no way you're getting out like that. So Klinger would just wouldn't dress like that. He'd be doing something else crazy to get this right. Story. Well, and that portrayal, you know, that that'd be like, there's something about it that to this culture would be like, you're trivial, you're trivializing the struggle, or you know what I mean? There, yeah. I can see cancel culture coming for fucking Klinger, man. For Klinger. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, it could it could be coming for Klinger, you know. But I mean, I guess a lot of those those kids who care about that kind of stuff, they're they're not interested in watching a show like Mash you know yeah so that's kind of the advantage you know it's that's like a, it's like a, i don't get a whole lot of comments on my videos saying what a horrible person i am you know because i'm not woke or whatever and because uh you know they're not searching for the topics that i talk about you know, <laughs> right, the, the people yeah. who care about that don't care about that you know? i don't know man you talk <laughs> about a lot of movies and like uh comic book culture kind of things and stuff. you talk about a lot of things in the pop culture realm that i could see people of that demographic or political leading sure. coming for you be like i came here for the fucking avengers review and i left because this guy's opinion on you know whatever yeah. that thing is. well it's like abortion the it's that's like what the, that's one of the topics we should have is abortion and tech oh that's right a big news story. yeah yeah absolutely that's the big uh big deal that happened uh, the uh what was it the heartbeat bill passed in texas just uh -huh. a couple of days ago. Yep. I'm sure all the baby killers over there are like a, a real bent out of shape. They yeah. out, are they out in the streets whining and complaining that they can't kill babies anymore? There's been, I haven't seen any protests or anything. Then again, where I work on 6th Street is a couple blocks away from like the Capitol building. I'm not far from the Capitol building. It's up on 12th in Congress. Oh, okay. Um, but every time that I've walked by there since I've been in town, there's like a pickup truck parked outside with all sorts of, you know, protest fucking slogans written on it about killing babies and shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or about God. I can't remember if they're pro-life or pro-choice, but yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, dude, people, people are definitely upset. Uh, I'm seeing it from all over, you know, like on my 
Facebook feed, I'm seeing people from everywhere all over the country and the world talking about it, not just people here in town that I, you know, know and work with and do comedy with. Yeah, I've heard that um, uh, hashtag Texas Taliban is trending because of these, uh, what they said, like the Republicans have gotten their way and they're comparing, uh, you know, they want to control women's bodies like the Taliban controls women's bodies. Yeah, like, yeah I don't know. Republicans aren't making them wear burqas and, you know, forcing uh -huh. them into sex slavery. So yeah, I, mean, I saw a girl out at the nightclub with a fucking mini skirt that was like six inches above the bottom of her ass crack. So yeah, they're, so, uh, they're, they're not imposing modesty on anybody. For obvious reasons, I want to see that. I'm, I want to see I'm, that. I'm conservative. I want to see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of the liberals all over this country are getting all bent out of shape about that. And I'm just like, it's just so reasonable. It's so reasonable because I think that all life can starts at conception because that's where my life began, uh -huh. you know? And so, and if you leave it to its own devices, it becomes a human being, uh -huh. you know? And so I... I think that uh, abortion is just a, a horrible injustice and we're, uh, we're going to be outbred by the Chinese and the Russians and stuff like that because they don't, they don't believe, have this concept that a lot of liberal Americans had that humans are a scourge upon the planet and the fewer of them that there are, the better everything is. And it's like, well, if you want world peace, yeah, I guess we could kill all of humanity, but you get to see how that is like uh, 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 counter to the point, you know? Right. Yeah, it's like if you want to wipe out the human race just to make world peace, it's like you're creating a basically a war, you know. And if you're saying that abortion is a good thing, it's like you're talking about genocide. That's genocide of peoples. And you know, you want to talk about like uh, uh, the disenfranchised, the minorities in this country who you know use these services the most. You know, you want to talk about that, fine. But I mean, those are the people that are going to be punished. You know. Well, you know the thing, but the thing about that is, is going back. When the institution Planned Parenthood was first started, there's there's a lot of racial overtones to the foundation of that organization, and it's, and if eugenics. you look at the, and if you look at the percentage of of black and brown people compared to white people that utilize this program, um, it's baffling, dude. It's 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 crazy, and and yeah, you're right. It is a form of eugenics, and I mean, getting back to you know, we were talking about this before we started. We were talking about fentanyl. You yeah. know, I think that, that that's another thing. You know, who's to say that there isn't people higher up kind of... I mean, the CIA has sold cocaine in L.A. before. So who's to say that some organization like that isn't inserting fentanyl in these different communities to help speed up the process of overdosing for the, the scourge or whatever, you know what I mean? It's We can't do a, a purge, you know, right. so... Here's a, uh, an alternative. Yeah, it's a culling. It's like smoking. It's like uh, it's like the fentanyl and the adulterant right. and drugs right. and so forth. It's 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 a way to cull the herd without saying we're actually purging the herd. You know, without we're, right. we're not actually killing anybody. They're killing themselves with cigarettes. You know? Right. And we come, we become like instruments of our own demise to a certain extent with all the rhetoric and and everything that goes around it. Uh. No doubt, but you have to understand it's like we are all complicit in our own demise, you know? It's yeah, like yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I, I don't think there's any real avoid avoidance of that, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, uh, at some point it's like, I think they did this thing on like Jimmy Fallon, where they said the, the white, uh, white people have decreased in percentage of the population for the first time ever or something like that. And everyone cheered. I'm just like, it's so genocidal. To, to be happy that, you know, uh, fewer Americans are being born than ever before, you know? It, it, and if you want to say it's like the, if the, like the uh, human race is causing things like climate change and stuff like that, and the world would be better off if there was like, like the Georgia guys, so say like 500,000 people on the entire planet or something like uh -huh. that, you know, if uh, the root of that idea is just genocidal at its core, you know, you're talking about wiping out the human race, yeah. you know? And unfortunately, it's like uh, America is like probably the only country in the world where we think it's a good thing that uh, we're not replacing our population. You know, we still have a yeah. high population because thanks God, thank God for uh, medical miracles and so forth. And the elderly are stay, staying alive longer. But, you know, we're not replacing once the greatest generation is gone. That's a big chunk of the American population. You yeah. Know? 
And so, uh, you know, it's going to be a bad thing if we have to actually go to war with somebody. You know? Yeah, no, totally. Especially, and, you know, because we've talked about it before about predator drones, aerial, you know, aerial attacks and things like that. But you, you said it, you can't occupy a city without feet on the ground. Absolutely. And, um, you know, these places do out, outnumber us and, you know, um, outbreed us. <laughs> Thanks to Maoist policies and some of these policies that they had in China, most of them are fucking dudes too, man. Yeah. You know, and I'm not trying to sit here and put down the other gender, but I think we can all agree that for the most part, over the course of history, of a larger percentage of the scale has shifted towards men being the ones fighting in war. Yeah. You know I mean, women do fight in war. I mean, women snipers in Stalingrad fucking helped, you know, sure. wipe out the Russians and shit like that. And Germans, yeah. Or the, yeah, sorry, the Germans. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. So, it's like, uh, that sniper wasn't very good. <laughs> oh, I got you. <laughs> fire, rolling fire, rolling fire. <laughs> uh, shooting the wrong people. <laughs> yeah, but um, thank you for correcting me real quick. Oh, it's no man. problem. But I mean, I wouldn't really blame blame those Russian uh, conscripts. Yeah, but you you knew what I was trying to say. I just absolutely missed my words a little bit. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. You know, I've never really thought about it like that in, in those terms. And from a, I mean, a most a lot of people know me from a conspiracy theorist point of view. That that does kind of bode shittily for us. I don't know. It does kind of feel like it's part of the you know, the grand fucking scheme to sell us off to China, you know, our money isn't backed by anything, Scott. I mean, we're all, we're not even individuals. We're a corporate entity. So the United States is a corporate entity. <laughs> yeah. We're owned by England. Okay. I get it. Yeah. Whatever. No, we're owned by China. Yeah. I don't uh, think so. But, but back to abortion, this is you yeah. know, getting crazy here for a minute. Um, as far as abortion goes, I am pro choice. Okay. Um, to a certain extent, you know what I mean? Especially, you know, for, especially for rape and incest. Um, I mean, you know, I, I did see a good example the other day of like, you know, it, it was just like a political cartoon that was, you know, like a, a rich guy yelling at a, at a homeless lady with a kid that's like, if you couldn't afford it, you shouldn't have had it. And it's like, well, and then you, you take Planned Parenthood away or take this you know, apply this abortion bill in Texas. So there are instances that I feel like, like uh, eugenics, since this, this is the terms that we're putting it in, uh, is applicable. <laughs> sure. I don't want to say necessary, but applicable. And, and but yeah, I mean, you're, you're totally right. But, and, and another reason that I, I wanted to say this too, I'm not pro-choice for, you know, personal or selfish reasons or anything like that. Um, I so, purposefully don't go out and blow my fucking load in people that yeah. I can't see myself raising a fucking child with. Sure. Um, and even at this point in my life, I am aware enough to know that I am not financially stable or even mature enough to be the parent and the spouse that i need to be for the so, sake of the child and for the sake of the relationship absolutely. right yeah um but if it came down to it i wouldn't i wouldn't you know lobby for an abortion right if, if i was out here dumping irresponsibly dumping my fucking load into people because I don't, sure. I don't use a condom, but I don't fucking come inside people as well. Sure. So, um, and also don't let people come inside you. And maybe that's fucking easier said than done. I'm not a girl. I've never been coerced into having sex. And yeah. what the fuck? You know what I mean? So. I thought you, know, said you pull out. Whoops. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and people get drunk and have sex and, and pre-cum happens. And, but, but Scott this, and, but Scott that, and yeah. Okay. But at a certain point, if it happens, you need to take responsibility for it unless, you know, absolutely. And I think the issue is circumstances. Right. But I think the issue is that people are using abortion as contraception and people always, right. bring, and people right. always bring up the, uh, 
the rape and incest thing, but you're talking about like a tenth of a percent of all the abortions performed have anything to do with rape or incest. Right. And even then, you you cannot erase a crime of rape by committing another crime, which is killing the baby. You know, same thing with incest. You know, uh, um, it, uh, and a lot of times these abortions are performed because, you know, something's going uh, wrong with the fetus and, you know, like uh, they suspect like Down syndrome is coming and it's just like, oh, I don't want to have a child, like a special needs child. So they're going to abort the child. And that is eugenics. And people, a lot of people don't understand is like, that's what you're doing. If you're trying to like, you know, stop, you know, breed out the quote unquote weakness in, uh, in humanity. It's like, I, I think your, 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 uh, your premise is genocidal at its core. Uh-huh. And I, I can appreciate the fact that you, you yourself would, you know, if God forbid you got some girl pregnant, uh, you would be, you would man up and, you know, find, uh, find find it within yourself to do what you need to do to raise that child properly i mean right. and i think i think a lot of people there are a lot of people who would do that but unfortunately most a great majority of the abortions that are performed in the united states are for selfish reasons you know and it's we're not talking about like poor women who aren't able to get abortions because you know poor women generally can't afford abortions you're talking about rich promiscuous white women general you know who you know have have the money to be that irresponsible right yeah you know you know condom is way cheaper than an abortion yeah so and so, um so you know at the end of the day i i do i am pro-choice to an extent um i don't know how much i agree with the bill because i haven't looked at it that hard but i think that we can all agree when it comes to abortions if they are going to be legal that there should be some sort of fucking cutoff date. Um, And I think the main thing that I want to express when it comes to this, because although I am pro-choice, like a lot of these people who are upset about the bill, um, I'm sick of the rhetoric um, and I'm sick of the double speak because isn't, uh, you know, isn't the left and like the Democrats, aren't they supposed to be the more, compassionate party and, and more compassionate people um but then you see them you, you know then things like this happen and uh and yes there's a certain level of compassion towards the, the idea of like well, let women have control over their bodies and you know bring fucking um but yeah well, have, have some compassion for the child have some compassion for the unborn life you know what i mean if absolutely you it's, care about everybody getting vaccinated so much so we don't fucking kill grandma but but you have no problem you know killing an unborn fetus yeah it, or, or an underdeveloped fetus well, however you want to phrase it however and, you want to look uh, at it i guess yeah I, and i'm not trying to be you know I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do with their bodies or other than what to do with their mind. And that's just, you know, think a couple of times about it and try to be more compassionate. Like, like you are towards, you know, the transgender community and the, and the, you know, the gay community and, and, and the Muslims and, and everybody else that you're compassionate towards. Uh, but as soon as it doesn't, you know, fit your narrative or, or, your wants um which in this case is not wanting to be pregnant or not wanting to go to term then you're not as compassionate about that thing so well i mean i think i think mostly people use it as uh uh, as contraception i think that uh i understand that dropping load uh, dropping a load inside is really awesome I get that. I've been there. I've done that. Loads. We dump loads, Scott. <laughs> That's what we do. And, uh, <clears throat> and God, you know, uh, lucky me, you know, I never got anybody pregnant by that, but I, I know my life would have been really different if, if, uh, I had gotten somebody pregnant in, by that manner. And, uh, I think that, uh, using, you know, killing a baby for, uh, uh, just so you don't have to take responsibility is incredibly incredibly selfish and vile you know i think that it's uh it's like oh I, i'm i'm too young you know my career you know it's gonna ruin my career if i have a baby so i'm just gonna you know flush it out you know it's just it's just and they're so casual 
they're so right. casual yeah. about it. it 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 really it really upsets me you know and people are sitting there walking around all day every day in this day and age on social media saying i'm offended i'm offended it's like i'm a christian compromise then what yeah. can, can we put a cap on abortions all right y'all can have but you get you get three you get three and that's generous i think three very generous how many people do you know that and look and i'm i know people i, I know people that are very close to me that have had that have gone through the experience and regret it and, and hate yes. it and, and it eats at their fucking soul yes. and i know people who have gone through the experience and they'll tell and they have at least told me that they don't regret it and and, and yeah as long as that's what they've said, then I believe it to be true and, and told I'm told otherwise. So, uh, but, but yeah, I don't know anybody that's had gone through that experience more than once. Yeah. So, uh, let's put a fucking cap on it with the, with the caveat, you know, unless it's in fucking case of rape or incest, you can have three abortions. Dude, I think that's pretty fair. I think that I'm being super fair. I should be, that was so diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was and if and if you and i could vote on that i'd vote for that right now in terms of to get making progress in the direction of not killing babies you know uh at least how, not like full throttle i mean is there a limit that that's no there's no limit yeah yeah is, you know is there a cap can we put a cap on it i think you're right the, the casualness of that is like it's gross it's yes it's gross. And uh, I think that I think the only real cap is a biological cap. If a woman has like too many abortions, it could really ruin her plumbing, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. Yeah, definitely. That hurt my genitals. My genitals ached when you said that. Yeah, it, I, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, it's a tough question to be sure, but I mean, I don't think that uh, it should ever be done. Uh, it's silly to say that, um, abortion will ever like will never happen again like say if rovers uh, roe versus wade was overturned today you know it's silly to even believe that uh, abortions will not continue to happen in a black market kind of way all right it used to be the liberals would say that abortion should be safe legal and rare uh i think that in some ways it's like uh uh it could it could be performed in instances such as incest and rape but you know quit fucking your uncle you know you're over your cap you came in here like eight times you know just because right. it's incest doesn't mean you should keep fucking your uncle and then <laughs> at that point you know we just gotta abort you if you won't stop fucking your uncle well no, I mean, that's genocidal thinking i'm sorry you're right i should that be is, more that's genocidal that's uh eugenics again you know it's you like start it's a like, dating app called don't fuck your uncle.com or something <laughs> uh i don't know if it's gonna take off i don't know like I think incest porn's kind of big, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe it will take off. I don't know. I might have I I don't even remember the titles of porn I fucking watch you. I might have watched some step sister porn this morning. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to deal with the aftermath of uh of what happens in porn. No, there's no cleanup in porn, you know. There's no uh there's no call awkward call a couple weeks later. <laughs> I work at From a nightclub. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we always have to clean up weirdness. I'm sure. The, women are, the women's bathroom is always the worst. And I'm not trying to, you know, it's just an observation. But I think we've, is there anything else you want to get off your chest about abortion? Yeah, stop killing babies. I baby mean, killer, baby killer. Well, I mean, it's, I think we're all free to sin. I think that that's part of like, like, like I was saying earlier, it's like, I'm a Christian. I'm walking around defended all day, every day, because there's all sorts of things that I think are happening. But however, you know, I think that we are free to sin, free to have our vices and stuff like that. And so uh, uh, the only thing, as long as it doesn't result in somebody's death, you know, and that's, I think that's what abortion is. It's like, it results in the death of a human being. And so that's why I think it's wrong. And so it's, uh, uh, I can walk around being offended all day long, you know, since, you know, abortion has been legal all my life, you know, uh, it's not something I would choose to do for my life or for any, any of the consequences of my actions. It's not something I would choose, but I mean, at the, uh, and I don't think that other people should make that choice either. And so I think we all, we all are free to choose to sin. Right. And I think that's what I was trying to say too, is 
I it's not a choice or a vote that I would ever give. But if the other party wanted that option, I want them to be able to have it and I would support them whether I fucking like it or not. Yeah. Um, I, I always like to bring up the death penalty when it comes to abortion because um, a lot of people who are for abortion are also against the death penalty. Which, <laughs> which, and the, the irony is not lost on me. All right. But at the same time, you know, I am for the death penalty. But when it comes to Hey, madman, are you willing to throw the switch? Are you willing to hit the injection, push the button for the injection? I don't know. I don't know if I want that death on my conscience. You know, it's, I mean, I think that that's a tougher question. The death penalty is a tougher question than, than abortion, you know? No, yeah. Um, this is Texas, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. You're in Austin. You, uh, did Joe Rogan cough on you yet? Oh. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, Joe Rogan hasn't coughed on me. No, no, no. I haven't got coughed on by Joe. Uh, but uh he's he's super nice to the staff and the comedians at the establishment where I'm at. And his uh his security guys, they're real cool too. All the other comedians, anyone that you've you know seen, like Hinchcliffe, Duncan Trussell, uh they're all really sweet and you can tell that they have a certain respect for what it is that we're doing. They, they know that we're, you know, we do open mics and we're getting. Oh, they freeze on me here and there and shit like that, that we're trying to be comedians. The freeze. Yeah. For a second there. Uh, you, got, where did off? Uh, you, you know, that they're there. They're, uh, they have respect for you. You're open mics. You're at open mics. You're in the trenches doing the work, I guess. You're yeah, saying. so as far as, like, the staff at the venue and, and the, the comedians that work there and stuff, they, they seem to have a certain level. It feels like they have a certain level of respect for us because they know the dedication that we're putting into it as yeah. far as They've moving been there. here. You know, moving here from out of state, from L.A. and Michigan and, and Virginia and you know, Ohio and all over. And not only that, but making sure that we get a job there and work as the door guy, because that's at the comedy store. And, you know, and that's, where, that's what Joe did, right? Well, did he work the door? I don't think Joe ever did that. Um, I think by the time that Joe got to the comedy store, he was already pretty well established. Oh. Okay. Because he started off in like Boston and New York and right, right. Um and, and stuff like that. And then in the early 90s, he had already done news radio. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and once you especially back then, once you get that credit that uh, has been on news radio, as as seen on news radio, or as seen on whatever network that it was that he was on. Right. Once you have that credit, that really helps with your booking. Um Sure. When you're sending out your electronic press kit, your tape and your, you know, your bio and your, and your resume. So I think by the time, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not like a Joe Rogan historian, but I'm pretty sure by the time that he got out to LA and, and the comedy store and stuff that he was already, yeah. uh, pretty well, he was already established enough that he didn't have to do that. Cause he started, and he started working UFC when he was really young too. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, well, we're calling him Joe like he's our friend. So, but um, that's all fucking, you know, semantics pretty much. I could have just said no and then said, went on to say, like Jim Carrey and Letterman, a lot of people, Tony Hinchcliffe, a lot of comedians worked at the comedy store as bartenders and door guys and, and whatever, and parking cars and what the fuck ever the thing was that they could do uh, to help keep their foot in the door and get stage time and stuff right uh and network and just be seen and, and be around these people absolutely um, but uh, everyone that i've met or encountered or kind of cross paths with that's of that tier of people that i was naming like you know rogan and hinchcliffe and christina pazinski dr trussell you know they they see what we're doing and and that's just that that's kind of cool to like be noticed by them and and yeah but to have that affirmation to like you know don't don't attach yourself to that but like you know accept that and then like 
accept it, apply it, and fucking move on and yeah. keep doing your thing. You know what I mean? Take it as an affirmation. But uh, absolutely. What I'm really trying to say is they're all really nice as fuck, dude. That's awesome, man. That's really yeah. awesome. I mean, uh, I know Joe Joe Rogan's been in the news lately because uh, he, he caught what caught COVID. He got the vid. Yeah, he got the vid, and uh-huh. uh, he, he went and like uh, posted something on Instagram saying he's taking ivermectin. And boy, did the media sink their teeth into that. They're like, oh, ivermectin's a, ho- it's a horse dewormer or something like that. And I'm just like, this is a Nobel Prize winning drug. You know, it's been used for uh, treatment, all sorts of things. You know, because Joe Rogan, he came and put on the Instagram video. So they, they just threw a bunch of, a bunch of stuff on it, like steroids and prednisone and ivermectin. And, and, uh, and the, it's, it's kind of like what they did with the hydro- hydrochloroquine that trump talked about uh, uh, when they started discrediting that right away because they they want to keep this thing going you know they uh, want to they want to keep uh, everyone scared it's like fear, yeah fear. yeah welcome to fear nn the most trusted name in news you know i mean it's uh and it, it's just it's so baffling so baffling to me that a lot of people are, are just are buying into this that they think that there's like no treatment you know uh for this kind of thing it's like even with brand new diseases you know there are tons of drugs that we can use like the hydroxychloroquine you know it was already a drug same with ivermectin already a drug and they would you know it it, uh it can it can treat similar type of uh of ailments or or uh, viruses and stuff like that and you can you can try it you can try it it won't necessarily have a net a bad effect on you but because joe rogan is just so public and he's been so public about i don't want to get the vaccine you know and because he's been so public about that, they say it's like you see it all. Oh, they're they're just hoping and praying that Joe Rogan would die so they could say, "See, see, we told you, we told you." And that is just like a twisted mentality, if you ask me. It's like everyone, as soon as he got it, it was, and it was announced, it was like, "Oh, Joe Rogan's going to be okay. He doesn't smoke cigarettes like me." You know that guy. I don't know how many Instagram videos where he's like, you know, a pool of water at the floor because he's working out all day long. That guy's a healthy, healthy dude. He's going to be uh-huh. fine. You know, but they were just the media was just praying he would like, you know, die, basically die. And I just think that is so cold and heartless, you know. Well, and that's that's the fucking thing that I was talking about earlier. I want to get back to that. But, and those are the people that are supposed to be compassionate, right? You would those think. are the ones that are supposed to be compassionate. Are the same people are like, fuck Trump. I hope he gets assassinated. You know, they right? used to say shit like that. I'm yeah. like, dude, do you understand like the you don't yeah. understand the hypocrisy in that. You know what I mean? Like, well, they've uh, been, you know, these people need actual Jesus, not the fucking typical biblical, you know, misrepresentation, you know, forced fucking indoctrination. They need actual Jesus. Like, they need compassion, dude. They need the fucking compassion. And love, love thy enemy. Yep. Fuck, I'm tr- yeah, you know, I'm trying to do it too. I'm trying to be a more compassionate individual, but that shit drives me nuts. And that's what I was talking about with the double speak. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you, you can't fucking have it both ways. You yeah. can't be like, oh, we're these compassionate people. We care about, you know, blah, 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 except you. Like, I hope you die. I hope, I hope. Someone on my fucking Facebook the other day commented, I hope everyone who's not vaccinated dies. Ha 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 ha. Like as like a just just like I told you so. Yeah. And like, and, you know, and it might have been a joke. I might have been taking them too literally, but whether it was, that was a joke or not, there has to be instances of people that are actually thinking that way and wanting that shit to happen it's like good i hope you fucking die and you don't understand the fucking yeah there's some kind of weird hypnosis going on there's like yes. two there's two truths that exist uh, and but there's one truth you know <laughs> yeah there's one truth and there's and then there's the two extremes right that are yeah. fucking way over here and way over here and they just it keeps getting further and further and it gets deeper and deeper and, and quicker and quicker with more levels of division like Dante's Inferno, you know, and, and everybody's so split on vaccines and abortions and guns and left and right and up and down and, and Black Lives Matter and communists and this and that and the fucking other. And it's like, 
what's the next thing? And and people are kind of unified on, you know, Afghanistan and, and, and how that went down, you know? Yeah. But it, it, they, they, they're both, but, but you see on the networks that there's still that like, even though they're kind of like, it's like a Venn diagram. It's like, oh, we kind of agree about how this went down, but also here's our fucking rhetoric opinion yeah. about everything too. And well, well, when it comes to like left versus right, it seems to me that the conservatives, the people on my side, uh, we've always been of the opinion that, you know, love, love your enemy, you know, love your friends, love your enemy, you know, and um, our, our quote unquote enemies, our political enemies, are, are those leftists that are saying you need to die because you're not you don't want the vaccine or something like that they're those kind of people and i've always been of the opinion that you know democrats liberals their they, their hearts are bigger than their heads you know and and um somehow somehow somewhere in our culture you know they've they've been given license to say you know it's okay to hate on or attack uh these these people because they don't believe in the kind-hearted uh, liberal uh, values that we had, you know, and so they they demonize like all these conservatives to the point that's like, oh, they're clearly all race, all racist. <laughs> they're all like anti vaxxers They all just <clears throat> they want to control women, women's bodies, and right. so like every time that anyone has a difference of opinion to them, automatically they become a Nazi, you know. Right. And so it's it, but I think the conservatives, you know, they they just. Uh, I think uh, Charles uh, Krauthammer once said, "Is like uh, liberals think we're evil. We believe that we believe that they're wrong." You know, uh, yeah. Liberals can believe conservatives are e evil. We just believe that they're wrong, or something like that. Yeah, it's all um, it's all very out of whack, man. It's, uh, <laughs> like I said, the, the level of double speak and and lack of compassion is just. It's saddening. It, yeah, it's, it is. It, it makes it makes me sad for the the state of America. Um, some of my most valuable friendships that I've had in my life are people that I have a very different opinions of um, politics and stuff like that. And I, I think I've spoken with you uh, about this several times. It's the fact that you know, even though we have a dip, we uh, like you're pro-choice, and I think that you're wrong for that. It's like you're any any version of pro-choice is baby killing, you know. We can disagree on that, but we're still friends. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just like the little poem in the beginning. And I think that if you don't hang around or interact with people who have a difference of opinion than you, you're just sitting in your room shouting your own beliefs at yourself until, the, until you get to a point where the only thing that's interesting about you are your preferred pronouns, right. you know? And that's why you get all these people out there just talking about themselves all day long about the pronouns they want you to use when, they're, when you're around them. And it's like, Jesus, it's like, I understand that narcissism is big in the youth culture today, but I mean, don't you have anything more interesting to talk about than other than the, 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 the words you want me to use when I'm around you, you know, it's just a very shallow, shallow existence. And it's sad. It's sad. If, Oh, if you like, if, if somebody says like, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, associate with anybody who doesn't wear a mask or something like that. It's like, you're doing oh. yourself a disservice, you know? Find out what's going on in the heads of those people. Talk to them. Relate to them. It was like Jesus, Jesus went around talk to everybody, sinners and, and the sinners and the pious alike. You know. Yeah. yeah, and that and it and it goes both ways. You know what I mean? It goes. It definitely goes both ways. And I'm I'm not a, I'm not. I don't wear a mask. I don't have a vaccine. Um, well, Texas is like has no mandates for masks, right? Yeah. Um, some you know some businesses are still have sure. these signs so if you know if i want to go in there i'll put a mask on if i have one of course but uh to, you know getting back to the levels of division and stuff uh you know if, if you disagree with either side on one topic well, they automatically assume that you're down the line on everything else Oh, if, if you have this viewpoint that's liberal, then you must be liberal about everything. You must right. love Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> but I mean, if, uh, but if, 
if all you're talking about is like your preferred pronouns or your lived experience and you know or whatever you know it's like you need to talk about other things in order to you know connect with people because if all you're talking about is like your political views or your, your social views and stuff like that it's uh, it's it's not how you can connect with anyone it's like it's like flipping through tinder you know i'm single i think you are too you know, I flip through Tinder uh, quite often, but I mean, people bring up politics in their Tinder profile. It was like yeah. Trump, Trump supporters swipe, swipe left or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, it's like, you know, before before I even meet you, we're in an argument over politics. You know, I mean, granted, it's good for somebody like me not to go ahead and swipe left on them, you know, because it's like that's going to be an argument sooner or later. <laughs> so I mean, uh, uh, so, uh, but I mean, at some point you have to connect with people on some other basis other than politics or your social, social views, you know? And so that's why you have to talk about something else. It's like, I don't know how many TikTok videos there are out there of somebody explaining their, per their preferred pronouns, you know? And it's like, geez, can you talk about anything, anything else? You know, I'd rather hear conspiracy theories <laughs> than somebody <laughs> talking about, you know, uh, you know, themselves so damn much. What's your favorite conspiracy theory? My I don't know how much favorite? I believe any of my conspiracy theories anymore, but they're like, they're fun to collect. I realized that at one point, like they're fun to collect. You know? Oh yeah. Like what? mystery balls, you know? Ah, uh, like, sure. What if, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I don't think I really have a fa favorite. I mean, I, there's, uh, there's plenty of them that pique my interest. Uh, there's the, the Rendlesham Forest incident where uh, uh, in, in Britain, where a couple of soldiers went out to, they saw the UFO in the, in a, in a, in the woods or something like that in the forest. And there's these markings all over it. And some guy like touched it and got blasted by a vent or something like that. I think that's a really cool story, you know? And I think that's, I'm, I don't believe conspiracies, conspiracy theories or anything like that. I just think, I think it's very, it makes for very entertaining stories. I mean, well, what do you think about aliens? That, that, I mean, that, that, that would be your favorite conspiracy theory, sure. then. Aliens. aliens has to be the most, like, the biggest, you know, one that aliens, do aliens exist? If they do, does the government know? Are they hiding it from us? Right. You know, that's, that's a conspiracy theory. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I, think, I think what's interesting is that um, before uh, UFOs became a thing, you know, in the 50s, it was like af after the Second World War, and the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, grew a little cynical after the Second World War. And then all of a sudden, like, the, the flying things you saw in the sky were no longer the chariots of the gods. They were no longer a wheel within a wheel that comes and talks to Ezekiel. You know what I mean? They weren't angels and demons anymore. They became aliens from other planets, you know? And uh, I'm sure you've heard about, like, uh, 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 you know, prior to you know, the fifties where science fiction became a thing, really became a thing. Uh, before that, it's like anything that came out of the sky was considered to be like a God and so forth. And so I think it's quite possible that aliens, if they exist, they are actually angels and demons who are uh, battling for the souls of uh, humanity. And I think if we ever captured one or if they came down a ramp and talked to the president of the United States, uh, they may say, yeah, I'm, I'm an angel or I'm a demon, you know, and I'm, I'm just trying to get human souls, you know, and the, I, I think that the, the government would be very big on suppressing that, right? They'd be very big on saying, uh, yeah, we have factual proof that everything in the Bible is true, you know, and we're fighting for our, our, the souls of humanity here. That's our purpose. <laughs> and I think it would blow a lot of people's minds that there'd be tons of conversions and stuff like that. But I think in, in many ways, that's kind of a, uh, kind of a, a, against the very nature of faith. If there was actual proof that, you know, God is real or angels or demons were real, I think that, uh, I think that would ne uh, negate the effect of faith. Why, though? If God, if God created the universe, that means he created it in all of, all of its infinites. Yep. So if there were other beings within the universe, that doesn't make their that doesn't make them any less significant to his creation. Absolutely. Because you know I mean? if, if God is all knowing and all of this is like 
purposefully plan and coordinate it and moving like the fucking, you know, like gears, then he planted them wherever they are and us where we are and then gave us each our abilities and skills and perceptions and languages and whatever. And then it was within his creation that they cross paths at the time that they do, right? And that they perceive each other the way that they do, meaning that we perceive them as aliens, angels, interdimensional beings. Sure. And, and interdimensional beings could be angels or aliens. Um, I've smoked DMT. <laughs> I think a lot of people that have who would, would agree that uh, they're, they're interdimensional. And, you know, when you study, you know, mysticism and different religions and theologies and fucking aliens and, you know, uh, you know, the frogs and, and everything, you know, you start to see some of the correlations between all those things that they might be one. Well, uh, I mean, it could be that, uh, if aliens came down and like met with the president and they could, the first thing out of their mouths could be, have you heard about the, the healing power of Jesus Christ, the Lord, our savior, you know, the aliens come and said, like trying to get, bring us the quote unquote good news. You know, it's, that could be the case. You know, I think in the Bible is that Jesus went off to speak to other flocks, you know, and some people have speculated like Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, he went off to different planets where other life forms were, you know, experienced life as their life ex exists and bring the good news to them as well. I think that absolutely and anything that's sentient enough to be curious enough to come to this planet, you know, probably has a, their own culture and their own religion and their own views. And I wouldn't be surprised that not only do they, do they look a lot like us, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if they're culturally, they have very similar views to us, like, like a, a Christianity or a Bible or has very uh, similar moral views. Cause I think a lot of how society gets to a point where we're technologically advanced that you would you and i are in two different states to uh have this uh you know a zoom meeting <laughs> you know to get to that point you have to have a cultural framework in order to allow for that kind of a uh, thing to develop and i think right. western culture yeah. is built upon uh, uh the religious teachings of christianity Man, and Judaism. so that means aliens uh it means aliens exist they have art right so they have yeah. like museums and culture and architecture yeah. and sculptures and paintings and and yeah. theater and comedy and and music oh dude can you imagine interdimensional fucking comedy and and like interdimensional music absolutely i mean i think i th i think uh uh xeno xeno tourism might be an interesting thing that ha could be one day in america and human the human future you know, where people will go to other planets just to look at their museums, their art, experience their comedy, experience their music and stuff like that. And uh, I, I feel like it, I may not see it in my lifetime, but it's certainly one of the things I'd be very interested in knowing about uh, once I reach heaven and like can, I could know all things. I would love to love to see how other cultures uh, uh, who grew independently of us, you know, uh, how how they treat art and so forth. Uh huh. Yeah, because you're right, man. And I, I'm a big believer in like, you know, art is a very important part of society and culture and, and, and everything. And uh, yeah, so if, if there's civilizations out there that are much more advanced than us, that at least technologically speaking, or even, you know, psychically speaking, or, you know, mentally speaking, physically speaking, then uh, I'm, yeah, imagine what their art looks like and shit. Well, what's funny about it when you talk about art is uh, like, t let's, let's take music, for example. Uh, the rules of music are true no matter what, because it's all based upon frequencies. Like if you're, if you're living on earth, a C sharp is a C sharp. But even on Zorbulon 5, they have a note that is a C sharp. So you can get music, learn music from another world and bring it back and play it with music, human instruments. You right. know what I mean? Because music is about frequencies and the change in frequency is what gives the different notes and so forth. And, and all this is governed by the laws of physics and mathematics in the universe. So all music 
you know, it's it's like in a close encounters of the third kind where they use music and lights to communicate with them because it's all music. The rules of music are the same throughout the entire universe. And I think that's a very cool thought. You know, it's it's one thing to think that we're all united in our star system because everything in our in our uh, star system, it was forged within the heart of the star. So all the atoms in me and all the atoms in you all came from the same place. You know, that's a very cool thought. What you have to understand is like the rules of music are the same throughout the entire universe. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That very, totally makes very sense. cool. And to anybody who is interested by that concept, I highly recommend reading a book called Nothing in This Book is True, but it's exactly how things are. And uh, in that book, it kind of touches on the mathematical and rhythmic and musical nature just of the universe and its interlockings. Um, but yeah, dude, yeah, you're, 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 man, you're fucking far out, dude. That was righteous, brother. Well, I mean, uh, I try, I tried to talk about this subject last week on my show, but uh, about like atheists, atheists have a complex relationship with God and they're like, but atheists don't believe in God. It's like, yeah, but most atheists I mean are, I, I've met in my life are very angry at God. And so, um, and I tried, I, I, I don't think I captured the, the thought a whole very well on my show, but uh, I think that there's a lot of things in the universe that make me believe in intelligent design. And uh, the, the, the rules of music being the same throughout the universe is one of those things. It's like, there's like the golden ratio. And exactly. uh, I mean, it's, there's, and only, only humans can really look at something that is art and say that that is beautiful or see a sunset and say that is beautiful you know no other creature can experience things like art like we can you, uh even if you play music for animals animals are attracted to music like you can sit there and like play a guitar and cows will gather around it's been done they they're just they're curious they don't really know what it is you know and they say like music soothes the savage beast and it's like they can they can un, they can hear it but they don't really understand it the way that humans do you know right yeah so there's uh if anybody interested in that concept uh, after watching this podcast there's a show on netflix called explained right have you ever seen like the documentary series uh netflix? yeah i think i think i have yeah and it's a bunch of like short documentaries but one of the first ones is music and in that they talk about animals from all over the spectrum and how they can only perceive these different, you know, they can understand rhythm, but they don't understand lyrics and they can understand tone but, and, and explains all these different facets of, of music and how humans can hear and understand, you know, all eight of them or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, certain animals can only understand one or two yeah. of the uh, workings of music. Well, I mean, uh, in many ways, they just they perceive it as vibrations, you yeah. know, and uh, especially like lower order animals like insects and so forth. Uh, uh, and so uh, and, and, that, and that generally is like is the only way that they really perceive it. You know, it's kind of like how they say like dogs are colorblind, but they're, they're not really colorblind. But I mean, it's a uh, it's just the way that they perceive is so different from us. And uh, I, I don't want to use the word inferior, but it is inferior. And we have these gigantic heads you know, and stuff like that. If you've ever seen uh, uh, any other creature other than a human give birth, there's way less screaming, you know? There's a lot less pain for those creatures with smaller heads, you know? <laughs> we got the big, we got the biggest heads in the universe and the women, they, they pay the price for it. You know? yeah. Epidural, cut it out of me, you know? Yeah, and that's why abortions should be legal. You should only get three. I just, I just like seeing women suffer. That's all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why? Because, because they make you suffer. Are you? Yeah, are you? It's incel revenge. Uh, <laughs> incel? No, no. I don't think I don't. I don't think anyone has a right to sex. You know, and I think that the whole incel community is kind of. They think that they because they are human beings, they have a right to sex. It's like no. It was, it, sometimes you're just ugly. You're not worth. You know, women look at you. They want to breed with the best. You know, that's that's natural selection. That's natural eugenics, and that's how it should be, you know. And if, and if you're just if you're too busy playing World of Warcraft to actually put invest time into a relationship, you know that's not the woman's fault. 
you know, it's easy for somebody like me who faces constant rejection, not very good looking and stuff like that. Women just aren't interested in me. I'm not tall enough to be interesting. I'm 5'11". I'm, I'm exactly average for a male, you know, and so it, I don't really stand out. You know, I'm better looking than you, but because you're over six foot, you know, you're going to get more women. That's all there is to it. You know, I can, I can see on your face. You don't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to, you know, just leave my ego out of this. Okay. You know? But what I mean, I'm trying not to keep but, but bring no, my I mean, ego into it. You're right. As far as nature goes, it's, it is just part of genetics that we look for. Typically, men are attracted to women with bigger bosoms and hips, at least in Western culture. Um, and women are attracted to men with, you know, that are that are tall, fat you know, long hair, and you know, blue eyes, and that are funny, and have a cool podcast with their friends. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but, I you, mean, but you know what I'm saying? Like they, yeah. they do. It's it's part of our culture like as far as pop culture and just, you know, the, our programming, but it's also, it is also like a little bit nature that we look for certain things physically at least. Um, and, you know, mentally, emotionally to decide who is a, you know, potential mate. When, uh, when I first got started getting on social media, when first so from first social start social media started coming around, I'd frequently get on. This is before I was getting you know getting proper treatment for my depression. I'd frequently get on there and start whining, complaining, typing away on Facebook, saying, "Oh, I could, uh, girls don't ever never want me. You know, I'm ugly and stuff like that." Then I'd get private messages from these girls I knew in like high school or something like that. It's like, "Hey, you know, I I tried getting with you back in the day, but you didn't seem interested." You know, I don't know why you're whining about that, but I mean, you know, so a, a lot of it's my fault too. So, I mean, right. you can't, you can't be an incel and sit there and say like, I'm completely unloved. You know, it's like, no, you could be loved, but I mean, if you, you got to drop your standards, you know, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a, it's a basic fact of life. And you cannot think that you have a right to, it's like, I'm a male. It's like, uh, I, you know, I, uh, I have a good job. You know, I have an interesting job. I have plenty of money and stuff like that. I should have a very beautiful woman. I should have a 10. And I think it's a lot of these kids growing up today with so much easy access to porn. And so in their, in their heads, they're, uh, they think that they deserve a 10, you know, and I'm, I hate to, you know, boil women down to just numbers, but I'm using it as an example. So everyone ha thinks says like, Oh, I deserve a Scarlett Johansson, you know, and it, that's just not true. Back before the internet, my spank bank, was filled with like sixes and sevens, girls that I knew, that I liked, you know, and I liked them for their personality or I liked them for their individuality. You know, they weren't tens, they weren't all gorgeous or they weren't all perfect, you know? In fact, there's uh, plenty of women that I had, you know, I had crushes on and stuff like that, that I, and I love them for their imperfection. And so I think a lot of kids are growing up today with thinking that they deserve a 10. And it's like, sorry, I'm a four. I'd be lucky to get a six, but I need a lot of money. No, yeah. And the entitlement that comes along with that type of thinking only sends you further down. Uh, uh, put, and, it, it only puts you in a darker place as time goes on. And then if you do get what it is that you desire, uh, then it typically tends to affect your ego in the wrong way. And then you don't, you know, you can get the thing, but holding on to it is a problem. And you, know, you fucking self-sabotage because your ego got out of whack. Because before that, your ego was out of whack in a different way where it was stuck in some, you know, sense of entitlement and fear of being alone or whatever the fucking thing is. Instead of focusing on yourself and your business, handling yeah. your business. <clears throat> yeah, I don't. I don't know what's up with those incels. I think that they're, uh, like you said, entitlement. I think that was the word I was looking for earlier. They they feel entitled to uh, sex with tens, and I think that, I think that that's silly and immature. For, for me, Scott. For me, the last couple girls that I dated or had like, you know, a decent thing with before whatever downfall we had or fallout we had. Some of them I'm still friends with, but. It happened when I wasn't 
looking for something and when I and 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 I don't and I don't even mean like I'm not looking to date, like I wasn't looking to fuck or or just I wasn't thinking about that. Right. And instead I was focusing on writing comedy and doing open mics and doing podcasts and and doing all the little things that I needed to do to yeah. better myself and meditate and exercise and play with my dog and whatever the fucking thing was that I needed to better myself. And the more that I did those things, the more everything around that just kind of fell into place as far as like relationships and money and opportunities and whatever. So, yeah. So focus on yourself, but you can't focus on yourself and be like, and the whole time that you're doing it, be like, did it happen yet? You know, all right. I wrote a joke to, to the thing, you know, am I, yeah. am I famous yet? Yeah. You gotta, there's this, there's this motivational speech that I like to watch and it's, are you willing to run when the distance is unknown? And that's something that you have to keep in mind when you're going, all right, I'm going to focus on myself. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to yeah. do comedy or my business or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. You just have to be willing to run. You have to be willing to open the shop every day and fucking yeah, that's a that's a great metaphor. It's like you, you don't know how long it is. You know, you don't know how long you're going to run for. Uh, my dad, the wisdom he gave me was uh, life is what happens to you while you're doing something else. And what that means is that, you know, you find something you want to do and you do that. You focus on that. And these uh, other things will will come in their own time, you know. Uh, and because I grew up, you know, in, as a, in a Christian home, and it's like, you know, God will bring, <coughs> bring, you, bring you what you need. And so I think that that's uh, kind of a, a a a good way to focus. It's like if you're if you're if you're if your real passion is to is to do your work, then you focus on that, and the other things will come along in their own time. You know, mm-hmm. and I think that's very important. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen a show called Firefly. You ever seen that? No. Okay. Well, there's an episode where the bounty bounty hunter comes on the ship. His name is Jubal Jubal Early, named after a Confederate. Uh, a soldier but uh anyway uh he comes on board and he says like uh it's like fifty thousand like fifty thousand credits to get this uh get river he goes with money like that i could retire this is a quote from him with money like that i could i could retire not that i would because what's life without work and when i first saw that episode that phrase really baffled my mind because the guy he said is like i could retire with that kind of money not that i would because i'd still want to work and it kind of baffled me for a while. And this is before I got into podcasting and stuff like that. And because I was thinking, it's like, shit, if I had the, enough money, I would sit around and do nothing all day long. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it's like, you know, I can't sit down at my computer too long with uh, five drinks in me without something coming out, without me typing away at something, you know? And so I realized that was the work. That was my work. That was the passion that I had. And so now... I have my own podcast. I do, you know, the Scott versus Scott with you, you know, and I, I'm writing all the time. And that's the passion I have. That's what I would do if I was rich enough to retire. And so that's what I have to focus on, you know? And so that's what I, and, and the whole idea of my writing is like, I want to entertain. I want to get my thoughts and feelings out into the world. I want people to know me, you know? And that's a, really what my writing is all about. And that's, you know, that's what I work on. That's what I focus on. And I think that people, they need to find this mission in their life, whatever that mission may be. You know, it could be, it's like, I'm, I want to be the best drywall guy in the, in the world. You know, it's a very simple and basic dream and it's very attainable, you know, but I mean, it's, it's something that you uh, want, to, you have to do. So you're not focused on like, why isn't my life going the way I want it to? You have to be working towards something, you know? And I think that, you know, you, you are one of the people who helped me realize that. You know, because you were you were quite motivated to do what you wanted to do. You know, you got your life together. You got off all the all the bad drugs and stuff like that. And so, uh, it, you know, got a handle on your life. You know, and I guess I was lucky that I never, you know, went down the dark paths that some of the dark paths that you've went down. You know, but I mean, you you still have to get a handle on your life. And you taught me that you know maybe I need to push a little bit more. Maybe I need to like run a little bit faster. You know instead of sitting around complaining like oh why isn't my life going the way i want to 
I want it to. It was like, well, be, be, be dizzy, distract yourself by doing something else. Well, I'm glad that I could have inspired you, Scott. Absolutely. That's what friendship's for, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It definitely is. I think in the Bible it says, as steel sharpens steel, so shall one man's soul sharpen another's. Oh, and yeah. I, and I think that that's why people, even of differing beliefs, should talk to each other, should interact with oh. each other, because you, you sharpen your sword, you sharpen theirs, and you can walk away in peace, you know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So we're, we're almost at about an hour we've been doing this. Did you want to talk about some other stuff, some new stuff? We didn't really get into it. Yeah, we didn't really get into things. Should we get a couple of the, I mean. Oh, I, I think we should talk a little bit about Afghanistan. And yeah. I, I do want to talk about what David Spade said oh, just a little bit. Yeah, no, we could definitely talk about those two topics. I think that sounds good. Okay. So when it comes to Afghanistan, I, I think uh, when we were talking about doing the show, you were you and I were talking, it was like, it was just so sad. You know, all the people that are, that are dying, you know, uh, are going to get killed in Afghanistan because of this really, really screwed up debacle. I mean, I've ranted a lot about this in the last couple of shows on, uh, on Shock Monkey Radio about my feelings on Afghanistan. But I mean, it's just a real, real shit show. And I think a lot of people left and right of the aisle, they realize like, boy, this is a real big fuck up. What do you think? No, oh, yeah, I feel the same way. I think it's a pretty big fuck up. Uh, I think there could have been better planning around it and that the evacuation of people could have started earlier before they pulled the troops out. Absolutely. Um, so, and, and, and I, I can't really, and this is one of those things that I'm like, I really can't see how anybody could disagree with that sentiment or that overall view of the situation. Yeah, I mean, how could how could you disagree with uh, the way that done, the way that it was executed? Because it was, it couldn't have been executed worse. And um, I know a lot of people who served in the military, a lot of veterans who served in Afghanistan, and I know that like I I've heard that suicide hotlines and stuff like that have been ringing off the hook for a lot of these Afghanistan veterans because they're like, after what happened there, it's like, what the hell did my friends get? you know killed for what did my friends get maimed for you know yeah. and so a lot of these what veterans my leg for what do i have this ptsd for exactly yeah and, i can only imagine yeah and they also <laughs> you know, worked alongside a, a plenty of <laughs> afghans uh, uh to in, in this in this mission they worked along with them you know became friends with them and now they know it's like you know they're they're going to be under the taliban rule and they're going to be dealing with these islamo fascists and stuff like that they know what's going to happen because they lived in, they lived in afghanistan they saw that the way their culture is and the way they are you know they saw the way that they you know they're inbred and they, they screw animals and they treat women like uh just vessels to uh, breed with and clean up after them and clean and cook for them you know that's that's all they all they think of women you know and i just I, it's just so sad it's just so sad. I mean, uh, I disagree with getting out of Afghanistan. I think we should have maintained our presence there just to keep, I don't know, the Taliban somewhat honest. You know, I think that we weren't really losing that many people in Afghanistan. I think we have the most professional military in the world. And the problem with this whole decision to leave Afghanistan came from suits, not the boots, you know. And if the commander in chief says, get out now, drop everything and get out now, you know, it's like, that's the order. You have to obey that or go to prison, you know? And so, I mean, and that's why you got all this equipment left behind in Afghanistan. And uh, just because they left all, all this U.S. military technology there, they have just created, like, they made the Taliban well, the, one of the most well-armed uh, countries in the world. Just because they, all the stuff they left behind. And that infuriates me. Get a little hot. Go, go no, back. no, it is. I mean, those are all reasons why uh, I, I don't agree with them either. I mean, the way the Taliban treats women, you're right, is is horrible. You know what I mean? And they they're forced to cover up. There's that complete modesty. You know, uh, that they, they've been one to throw acid in women's faces. And, yeah, they don't um, want they don't want them getting educated. You know, yeah, they, they don't want them educated. Yeah. yeah so, and you know this problem has been going on for a while in Afghanistan too, not just since, you know, 9-11 and stuff, but, 
you know, since before that, during the Cold War, when Russia had occupied uh, Afghanistan and then they got out of there and there was a civil war and America got in there. And uh, so. Well, I mean, great. Uh, Afghanistan has been referred to as a graveyard of empires because, you know, <laughs> Uh, lots of people try to, to uh, take over that area, that country uh, from those people. But I mean, the terrain just makes it incredibly difficult. I was going to um, say, the terrain, yeah. It's yeah. crazy, the mountain um, ranges and stuff. Um, well, it's it's similar to Switzerland in the sense that, you know, Switzerland can remain neutral throughout the Second World War because it is pr probably the most defensible, uh, you know, country in the world because of the, where it is. And so, I mean, it's uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, terrain makes things you know just in incredibly difficult uh -huh. to uh to conquer you know and so i don't know i think uh, uh, well, and, uh not only that not only is it a landlocked country that's just basically it's a horseshoe of, of mountain ranges yep but it's bordered by countries that are pakistan and iran iran yep. and china you yeah. know they're not necessarily any our buddies yeah so that definitely made the mission more difficult as well and like you said before it's always been a difficult mission you know what i mean if, if the taliban and the other rebels and whatnot with the you know with with the help of stinger missiles stinger rockets were able to get the russians out then uh but you know if 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 we're the most advanced army, then Russia and China have to be, uh, or Israel. But other than that, you know, those those two countries are uh, pretty advanced militaries too. So for them to be able to have done that, then just with AK forty sevens and Stinger rockets, uh, that does tell you a lot about the terrain, uh, their willingness to fight for yeah. what they believe in. Um, and, and yeah, and, and, you know, they know the country, they know yeah. the, they know the terrain, they know the cities, they, they know the nooks and crannies of it all. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, it's, it's, so just, yeah, yeah, it's just sad all around. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's incredibly disrespectful. I think when, uh, like Biden was checking his watch, I don't know if you've seen that in the news is like a lot of the conservatives been harping on that about Biden checking his watch like a bunch of times when uh, they're unloading these um, American soldier Marines who were killed in Afghanistan. You know, a lot of people are giving uh, him a hard time about his lack of compassion and respect for the, for the soldiers that died because of, you know, his call, you know, I think that uh, uh, a lot of the problem uh, when it comes to a civilian controlled military is that um, you can elect somebody into that office who has no military experience. And so, and uh, I think that everyone knows that Biden isn't really in control of his administration. Um, and so I'd hate to say it, but I think it sounds like a woman's decision to just drop everything and run. You know, it sounds like something Jill Biden would tell Joe Biden to say. That's, that's what it sounds like to me, because uh, anybody who has any service in the military would say, it's like, no, we need to keep the military there. We need to run operations to get all of our uh, allies and, and our um, American citizens and green card holders out through the airport. We control, like, try to control both the airports there and, you know, do an organized withdrawal. Instead, they're just like, get out, drop everything and go, drop everything and go. And so, and that's what, that's what it seems like it happened. What happened there? And unfortunately, because Joe Biden has no military experience, it's like, he doesn't really understand, it. like, that is a very unsafe operation. You know, and I've, I've mentioned this on my show, it's like, all throughout the chain of command, you need to understand uh, every single soldier has to, I think I said like Private Pogue needs to know that his chain of command has got his, got his back all the way up to the top so while he's busy focused down range, you know, because uh, he's the one in the most danger, you know, and that, that, that young Marine who gets killed, you know, those Marines who get killed, you know, they, they were betrayed by this administration. They died because of them. And he's just checking his watch. You know, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to be an ex-military watching this. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, Scott. And uh, this isn't, it's not anything new with the Taliban run 
Afghanistan. Yeah. Because previously under the rule, it was uh, a breeding grounds and a safe haven for for terrorists. And now it's terrorists, again. Terrorists, ter- the terror, the the terror, the terrorists are in Afghanistan, and we're gonna go in there with cowboy hats, and we're just gonna wrangle them out. All right. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we could talk about like the decisions of uh, of Bush if you want, and it's like getting us in there. But I mean, I think that we, we our mission was to uh, to punish Al Qaeda, who the Taliban were harboring, you know, in, exactly. in the borders of Afghanistan. And, well, that's um, what I was trying to get to is now with the Taliban back in control. Al Qaeda is coming back. ISIS is coming in. You know, it's like it's oh, well, that's the thing. It didn't take long for ISIS K, what they're calling it, yep. uh, this, this new strain of ISIS, um, the Delta variant, the K variant. Of ISIS. Yeah. yeah, ISIS, ISIS Delta variant. So, you know, it, it didn't take long for that faction to. Oh, the Taliban's in control. The Amer- you know, their American troops numbers are dwindling. Let's fucking do this attack. And then they did it. You know, they executed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the, the Taliban, when they instead of patrolling the town with their fucking, you know, they were at the gym, you know, just t- doing t- just not using any of the I, yeah. equipment correctly. Just I saw not- those videos, yeah. Not yeah. one piece of equipment being used. So they were at the gym, and then they were like, you know, dancing to Drake at the club, and you know, so yeah, they're uh, yeah, they're kind of idiots. But I mean, yeah, they're uh, having fun though. They're having the time of their lives. Yeah. Those, you know, those videos looked fun. I would have partied with them for a night at least. You know what well, I mean, a lot of people don't mention that, but a lot, mo- like of all all those videos that are coming out of Afghanistan, it's just there, there's just. It's a very, very diverse group of people. And it's like, no, it's all men. It's all men. And you know why? It's because the women are scared shitless. They are like dawn and burkas. They are hiding inside their homes. They're just because on, in all these videos that you see coming out of Afghanistan, it's just men everywhere because women are back in the kitchen where they think they belong and so forth. Oh, and they're, you know they're going to reassert their dominance, you know, then they, they're probably going to try to get some reimbursement for the, Oh, you think you've been having fun these past 20 years? We'll fucking show you, you know, so the, the, in the long run over, you know, over these next, this next period of time, as they're really taking control, uh, you might see or hear about some harsh conditions for women, which becomes a human rights problem. And then, you know, yeah. uh, and unfortunately, it was like we may have to go back in there, you know, and I think that the way that this was handled, uh, if it was handled right, we could have left and not ha- need to return. Uh-huh. You know, we could have left cleanly. It would have been a human rights problem no matter what, I think, you know, but I mean, we could have got out, out with our hands clean and say, hey, you know what they do after that is, you know, it's not really on us. But because we did this so poorly, it's like we we've made uh, Afghanistan even even worse than it was before 2001 oh. you know and i think that that's a damn shame because now it's like now these islamo fascists are going to definitely take over the country and they're going to go go back to the business of trying to plot terror attacks on america you know yeah it's very frustrating um they yeah, well and the other thing too is it leaves it open for you know for russia who classically yeah. And other countries, you know, class and China, like, yeah. and China it's, who like to invade that space. So, well, that's what we, I mean. It's like it, it because of this incident, it's made America look incredibly weak, you know, yeah, incredibly not, weak. And so yeah. that's why, like, and now, like, China is going to like maybe make a move towards Taiwan, you know, and Russia is like uh, uh, taking over other areas. It's like a lot of people don't talk about like the, what happened in Crimea the Crimea region is like, you know, Russia is taking over territories. China is taking over territories, you know, and nobody says boo to that, you know, but even if, if there's one American soldier in Afghanistan, every single leftist American is sitting there screaming like, boo, get them out, get them out, you know, and stuff like that. And so a, a lot of our enemies over time have taken up this tactic of like, you know, portraying the war of the Americans efforts in warfare as a bad thing, you know, uh, well, what, well keep going sorry like with vietnam you know it's like everyone's like every 
the entire world saw the U.S. leave Vietnam and saw the chop choppers leaving, you know, out of Saigon, trying to catch the last chopper out of Saigon, you know, they, how humiliating that was for the United States. And we have a very similar thing that happened in Afghanistan. But the whole world saw what happened in Vietnam and saw this uh, technically, technologically uh, un, un, under advanced country, you know, beating off a global superpower, you know. And so everyone takes the lessons learned of them. And the Vietnamese, what they do, they built a bunch of tunnels and stuff like that under the ground. Uh, it's a tactic that they picked up from the Japanese in the Second World War. When the U.S. is island hopping, the Japanese dug a bunch of tunnels and the Vietnamese did that too. And you know who did that too? The Taliban in the caves in Afghanistan. Okay. Yes. Everyone takes these lessons learned. And so at 20 years in Afghanistan and the, you know, you got Russia and China on behalf of the Taliban, you know, using their uh, spy network inside the United States infiltrating you know college campuses and the war is bad the u.s has got to pull out of afghanistan just like they did during vietnam or vietnam's bad we got to pull out of vietnam you know just to create the public perception to cause a democracy or a democratic republic like ours to pull out of troops because it's an unpopular war all of a sudden you know but at the end of the day you got to understand that the taliban are still as resolute as ever to kill us just as the same as China is just as resolute as ever to become a global power better than the United States. Same with Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, we can change our ideas and our sentiments and our culture all the time. We have that luxury. But you know, people in China don't have the luxury. People in Russia don't have necessarily have that luxury. Same with people who live under the rule of the Taliban. They don't have that luxury to say this is an unpopular war. I vote. We get it out. Those people don't even get votes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, you want to talk about it, one more thing? It's a terrible situation. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering if it was some, you know, there, it might be a chess move in ways, you know, it, it leaves the Taliban highly weaponized, you know, in, in future endeavors to defend against, you know, China and, and Russia. And you've seen how, you know, how those, uh, how yeah. Asia treats Muslims. Um, yeah. So <laughs> everybody hates everybody, I think. And if if the if the Muslims and the Jews and the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans all could just get together and sing a song and do a podcast about it, I think that we could, you know, figure this thing the fuck out, man. Three abortions, you get three. Cap capped it out. <laughs> hey, do you want to talk about this thing that David Spade said? I mean, I just, what, did David, what did David Spade say? What, one quick thing. Do we agree on? Do we agree on Afghanistan? I think I think we do agree on Afghanistan. Um, I think it remains to be seen, like what will happen. I mean, we're probably going to start seeing a lot of video coming out of there, like uh, maybe even hostage tapes. Uh, I, I I can I can foresee the Biden administration paying ransoms. For American citizens and green card holders and stuff like that, that's our tax dollars they are going to be given to the Taliban to ransom these people because they did such a poor job in Afghanistan. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of lot of people on the conservative side that say, "Oh, maybe we should impeach Biden." And it's like, no, 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 no. I don't want Kamala. I'd rather have Biden than Kamala. So, <laughs> so are we officially out of there? Officially, we're out of there, but there's still there's still Americans there. So, are they are they still evacuating people? Uh, I I think that there's private uh, private entities that are getting people out of there. I think Glenn Beck has a private jet that he's been flying back and forth, to get trying to get people out of Afghanistan. Uh, I I heard a story about some retired Navy SEALs went into Afghanistan to pull some people out. Hoorah, shipmates! Hoorah, you know. Yeah, I've heard a couple stories about that too. Yeah, and I think that that's I think that that's what's great about America is that there's even even despite the the failures that are happening up in the White House, you know, there's still Americans who believe in doing the right thing regardless, and I think that that's just amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, and I think that's why Americans are the best. You know, the West is the best. So there's straight up like mercenaries and and free enterprise people out there, independent contractors out well, there. Those guys they, weren't even getting paid. You know, they're not getting paid. They're doing it, uh, you know, at their own cost and stuff like that. And I think uh -huh. that that's, that's hard charging. You know, that's, that's somebody, that's a warrior. That's somebody who believes in what they're doing. You know? Yeah. I think that's great. That is.
beautiful. Try, yeah, you know, trying to make the best of a horrible situation, which it is. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about one more thing before we get out of here. And this is a uh, David Spade. It's an article I saw. He says that cancel culture has made his jokes dry. It's a quote. I'm not as funny. And uh, you made a joke earlier. It's like, yeah, duh, you're never funny, David Spade. But I, I really did like uh, uh, his bit in um, on Saturday Night Live called Spade in America. You remember that where he had like a little kind of talk show thing? And I thought he was pretty funny at that. And uh, I think that I think that he he's touching upon something, because when I read that article, I thought about um, uh, uh, George Carlin getting arrested because he did the seven dirty words bit somewhere and somebody complained, you know, and this was like what in the 70s. And somebody complained about him using a bad word and he got arrested. And you, you mentioned Lenny Bruce as well would also get arrested for, uh, for obscenity laws, you know. And I think that, you know, cancel culture has made people less funny. And humor is an incredibly valuable tool when it comes to dealing with the horrible situations. Like we could sit here and make jokes about Afghanistan, but the, all, the whole point of the humor is to be a pressure valve for all the stress that it's bringing on our lives. Uh -huh. You know, exactly. it's the same thing with abortion jokes. You know, we can make jokes about abortion uh, because it's uh, it's how you, how people deal with the pressures and the the you know intolerable pressures of life. And if we don't have comedians anymore, if and uh, you're a comedian and I'm a writer, and so our tools are the American language, are the words. Yeah. And if we don't have access to all the tools in our toolbox, it's like that that causes our trade to suffer. Yeah. You know, and so I need access to the entire American lexicon in order to make something funny or interesting or poignant, you know, and just like you as a comedian need to have access to the entire language in order to make things funny. You know, uh, you, you mentioned it was like the it was the conservatives. It was like the re hard religious right that was arresting people like Lenny Bruce and George Carlin back in the day. But then you remember, like there was a bi uh, bipartisan thing with like, I think, Tipper Gore and Barbara Bush. And they started the parental advisory labels on oh. records and stuff. You know, it's like, that's, I mean, this, the idea of cancel culture is not necessarily something new. You know, it's been going on here and there for a long time. It's just only like the extreme cases like Lenny Bruce or uh, George Carlin getting arrested, you know, while every other comedian is trying, is still kind of playing within the boundaries. Now it's like, as, as cancel culture becomes more intense in our day and age, you know, it's like more and more comedians and writers are suffering because of that. How do you think about it? Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Um, but I also, you know, with the new with the new rules and boundaries, I do believe that it. It forces us to because our job, at least as a comedian, is to almost establish the line you know, and, and walk that line. Yeah, dance along it, yeah. Okay. Right, of what, what you should and shouldn't say. Right. While if you're doing that, you know, at least for me, what I like to do is to at least have a purpose with it, you know what I mean? At least I'm, I'm walking a line of what you should and shouldn't say, but I'm saying something of value. Uh, but, but comedy is comedy. People should understand that People aren't intelligent enough to understand satire, right? And understand that something is satirical. Because um, for the most part, most comedy, when people are talking about these different terms or concepts, it's in a satirical way. Yes. They're not trying to trivialize the struggle or the concept. They're doing what you said. They're trying to bring something to light and release the pressure valve of it yep. or peel back that, you know, kind of veil of truth. And, and, you know, this is that thing that we all think about, or, you know, we all kind of secretly agree on, but we don't talk about, right. You know, whether it be a fucking fart or just whatever weird shit. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't think that people are so dumb that they don't understand satire. I think that it doesn't give a whole lot of uh, faith to humanity. What I do think is that people willingly ignore satire. They willing, willingly ignore humor just for the sake of being the, the outraged, you know, uh, just, just so they can make a fuss. 
right. draw attention to themselves. You know, it's like somebody, somebody who walks out of a comedy show. When somebody gets up and walks out of a comedy show because of something somebody said, that's them trying to steal the spotlight. They're trying right. to make it about them. And it's right. like, if you came into the show, whether it's free or whether you paid for it, you know, you willingly came here <clears throat> to experience this. And then all of a sudden you want to make, draw the spotlight on you. You know, and I think that that's wrong and selfish and narcissistic. And I don't think that that kind of uh, behavior should be indulged or even tolerated, you know? And unfortunately we live in a society where, you know, these kinds of things are tolerated, where they can tolerate, where people tolerate you know, somebody saying, oh, David Spade said this joke and I didn't like it and I'm offended. I'm ranting on the internet about it. You know, hashtag David Spade sucks. You know, you know that, that hashtag probably already exists, but when I'm, it, it's just it's just not right. You know, it's like it, it works against comedy. And if you think that like comedy is unimportant, you are a fool. Or, right. you, probably, or you probably have no sense of humor yourself. I'm trying to limit the English lexicon or any any language, trying to limit a language to an artist whose whose art form is language, whether it be a writer, comedian, uh, journalist, whatever. That's like that's like the equivalent of trying to blur, you know, nudity in a fucking beautiful painting, right? In, in, a, yeah. in, a, in an art gallery. Sure. You know what I'm saying? It's that's like trying to you know cover up the statue of David. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? It's it's like saying, oh well, you. It's almost and, sacrilegious, yeah. Right, and and the thing is, is yeah, there's places for that where there's art that that doesn't you know that has its limitations, right? That are yeah. museums where I'm sure you'd see no nude paintings or sculptures or anything of that sort, right? Right. Oh. Uh, but at the good places, the cool places, right? They have everything. They have all the beautiful paintings from all of the different types and stuff like that. And everybody comes there and appreciates it. And uh, comedy is the same way, you know? I think that, and, and I'm not trying to say that comedy should be segregated, but it kind of, it already is. There, there are comedy clubs that's like, you know, a more white collar comedy. And then there's comedy right. clubs that are more blue collar comedy where there's a lot of white collar comedians. And the thing is, is people go to those comedy clubs and don't know the other comedians. And it's like, and it's just don't go to a fucking comedy show if you don't like it. Don't listen to the comedy yeah. Don't watch it if you don't like it. You know, don't. Yeah, nobody's forcing it on you. Yeah. Nobody forces you to listen to country music. You know what I mean? You hate country music. You're not trying to fucking outlaw that. You know? But it, yeah, if you're so mad at it, why do you keep listening to it? You yeah, know, it, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's like uh, the, the old Howard Stern thing. It's like, why do people listen to him? Well, they want to see what he said next. It's the people who hate him listen for longer. If they hate him, why do they listen? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's it's people just they like hating on somebody you know and i get it you know i've been there i've done that it's like a, you know i've reviewed movies and said this is a piece of shit movie it's like don't go see it it's awful i get it i really do but at the same time i realized that i sat down and watched that movie so at some it, it's it's on me you know that's on me you know so i mean i think that that's a, a lot of people are ignoring their own uh the way that they're complicit in their in their own outrage you know, it's like you're sitting there uh, uh, sitting through it, you know, that's kind of on you. And I mean, I understand that as a comedian and as a writer, you know, sometimes you got to tailor your your content to the audience or the venue or the town that you're in or the kind of crowd that's in there that night. You know, you got it. You got to kind of I think. But I mean, everything can't be clean all the time. It's like just because every comedian can write like Jim McGaffigan doesn't mean that every comedian should be Jim Gaffigan. You know, right. you need Jim Gaffigan. You need Kevin Hart. You need Joe Rogan. You need Dave, uh, Dave Chappelle. You need all these different varied uh, uh, styles and so forth. You know, Dave Chappelle any, or any black comedian for that matter can get up there and say the N word 50, 60 times during the course of their show. But if one white guy says it once, uh, Michael Richards, it's a completely different thing. 
You see what I'm saying? But that's 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 a different thing though too. Because I'm I'm even of the you know it's not something that I'm gonna fucking try to do any time soon. But I'm even of the opinion that you can say certain words, you know, those certain words that you shouldn't say. Um, because there's a new list now. You know what I mean? You could add some to the George Car. God, could you imagine if George Carlin did a set right now? I know, right? Oh, uh, God rest his soul. God rest his soul. Okay. <laughs> uh, if 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 it has artistic value, if you're if you're not saying it with hate in your heart, you know what I mean? If you're if you're saying it in a way that's funny, in a way that has some sort of purpose or artistic value or satire to it, that's not with ill, like, hateful intent, uh, then, yeah, fucking say it, dude. Um, I'm, um, I'm with you on that. But, I mean, do you think that if a joke isn't funny and it, uh, and it's, it uses a quote-unquote dirty word, you know, is, is that proper use? You know, if you write a joke with the N-word in it and it's not funny, are you allowed to do that? Or does it have to be funny in order to for, for that allowed to be happy? You see what I'm saying? Look, it's, it's, look, I don't make the laws or anything for cancel culture. I know you don't. I know you don't. But uh, I'm going to recommend that it's fucking, it's a fire-ass funny joke. You know what I mean? And it has to be like well understood that there's satire and that you're not a fucking bigot. Well, so, uh, that's just my that's just my advice to you know other comedians. Right. Um. I think that you you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said it's like uh, comedians got to take the audience up to the line and dance along the line, you know. And I think that um one of the most uh the prime the prime example I would use in comedy today is uh, Tom Segura, uh, a comedian I have a lot of respect for. And uh, he will sit there, he'll make, you know, controversial jokes, but he, he'll say it through somebody else, or he'll preface it by saying, now, I just wanted to let you know I'm cool with everybody, but this is something my dad said, you know? Right. Uh, I, and so he, because he says it through a character or uh, through somebody else's, it's like this, I'm just repeating what they said to me, you know, uh, he, he's allowed to get away with it. And I think that, you know, Tom, Tom Segura is a little bit woke, him and Burt Kreischer are a little bit woke, and I don't like that about them. But I mean, uh, Tom Segura is not any less funny because of it. You know, I, I think it is possible for comedians to dance around that line and not necessarily piss people off and get away with it through like little, little tricks and so forth. But at the same time, it's like uh, not every comedian needs to be Tom Segura. You know, and there needs to be the foul mouth comedians who you know say horrible stuff and yeah, exactly. and, and uh, get the laughs for it. So, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, I'm sitting here like, well, I think this and I think that and comedy is fucking comedy. Comedy is relative. I think that comedians should be able to do whatever they think is funny. You know what I mean? Um, what I think is funny and, and what's funny are two different things because it's relative. It's all very relative. Well, most jokes are funnier in your head before you write them down. You know, I, I get that, you know, but I mean, at the same time, you know, it's a... Uh... If you're going to a venue, it's like any. Uh, uh, if you go to a venue, it's like, and there's people out there that could be hating on, hating on your joke or something like that. It's like you got to understand the kind of uh, person that would go to a comedy show, looking for something to be offended at. You know, it's mm -hmm. like what is going on in that person's life where they're so miserable, they are so yeah. miserable that they can't allow comedy to, you know, give grant them some relief from the horrible things we have to deal with this world, within this world. Instead, instead, just go to a comedy show, laugh at the jokes, and move on. You know, so it's, yeah. it's 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 good for you. It's good for the culture. Instead, you just you're bringing more hatred and, vit and vitriol and anger into everyone's life because you you found something offensive, whatever that may be. You know, and so I think there's a lot of sick people in the world to the point where you know it's like. It's like I said uh, during this COVID thing. It's like it's, it seems to me like the hypochondriacs has taken over the world. You know, it's like it, it seems ridiculous to me. And when it comes to this comedy thing, it's like it seems to me that the uh, uh, the new Puritans are these crazy leftists that think it's like, oh, you can't make jokes about transgender people. 
you know, it, it's it's like, yes, you can. People have been making jokes about transgender people for throughout all of human history. You know, Monty Python is bread and butter <laughs> with guys wearing dresses. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Uh-huh. Yeah, or like we were talking about Klinger in the beginning Klinger. of the Exactly. Um, so, so as a fan of comedy, like I said, I think that, you know, and as a comedian, I believe that, you know, do what you want to do, it's, but you better, you better be funny, you know, and, and that's not just me telling you that, you know, higher ranking, much higher ranking comedians than I will tell you the same thing. You know, do what you want to do, at least for the most part, real comedians and real funny comedians will tell you fucking do it, you know, do the thing. At least the comedians I'm a fan of. But you better be funny. And uh, so, you know, as a fan, I, and, and as a fan, I like all comedy. So so do it. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of, you know, walk the line, cross the line a little bit. Absolutely. You know, figure out. And, and as a comedian, I enjoy the challenge. I think it gives me an opportunity to be more creative and, and more obstacles and and shit to bounce off of in the fucking pinball machine that is you know comedy right, right. but i mean at the same time you know you, you're jumping through the hoops of this cancel culture at the same time i mean like i said you know just a, a, a good comedian should be able to write like jim gaffigan but not every that doesn't mean every comedian should be jim gaffigan yeah you know and it's like absolutely as a writing exercise it's it's good to be able to constrain yourself within those limits and still be funny within those limits. Yeah. However, you know, I think if if uh, uh, if your more natural speaking voice is like edgy and uh, 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 you know just offensive in many ways, it's like I think that that's that's uh, natural for many comedians, you know, and that's that's kind of the core of what you love about them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see them, you know, as restricting. I see them as like, you know, hurdles. You know, that they're, they're just like I said, they're 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 obstacles. It's you know, it's not it's not jumping through hoops, it's jumping, it's it's going over hurdles. And hurdles you can go over and you can win a race and you can, you know, beat the have the high score at the time of trial. So as a comedian, I enjoy the challenge. And as a fan of comedy, I enjoy watching a comedian who enjoys the challenge like. Tom Segura and the way that he finds the way to establish to strongly establish that this is a character that I'm doing right and then you know lay out the concept or whatever the thing it is that he wants to say whether you know and and then solve that problem with comedy yep you've seen ball hog right ball hog yeah Tom Segura's ball hog it's like your, your mom was a ball hog all of our moms are ball hog. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's good. I think it's a very talented comedian. I like him better than Burt Kreischer. I very much enjoy Tom. Tom is yeah. a very talented comedian. His wife, Christina P, is fucking hilarious too. Yep. I've seen her. Uh, I've seen her do stand up once or twice now. She's really funny. Kind of cute too. She's a very sweet lady. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool deal, man. Well, uh, you want to call it an end of the show here? Uh, it's the end of the show. We don't want you to go, but we want you to know that we'll miss you. It's Scott versus Scott, and I'm high on pot in Austin, motherfucking <laughs> Texas. <laughs> That's a great song. I, I should go uh, get grab my ukulele next for next show and uh, <laughs> come up with, come up with a new tune, the uh, outro tune for us. I like yeah. it. All right. So uh this has been Scott versus Scott. It was great talking to you, man. Yes, absolutely. Honestly, I, I, all I, the I, podcast and you know, this is my podcast voice. All that shit aside, Scott. It was really cool talking to you. Absolutely. Okay, miss you guys back in front of yeah. I'm gonna stop the recording here in a couple seconds, then we can talk off off the air here for a second. Yeah, man. No, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, but I wanted to get that on camera, bitch. Absolutely, man. I miss you already. I miss you already. All right, man. I'm gonna stop recording now. Yes.